All right. Two weeks left in Luke until we hit summertime. Two weeks left until we hit it. And uh, we will be coming to the end of what's called the Galilean ministry of Jesus. And this is kind of a good cutoff for us. We go into the summer. I will let you know, just a heads up, what we are going to be coming into once we are done with Luke this section. Uh, we will be spending two and a half months in the book that most of you probably have memorized, Habakkuk. Yes, yes. Uh, some of you probably never even read Habakkuk. And my heart in doing that uh, this summer is that you guys would learn to read the Old Testament through the lens of Christ. And so I am very hopeful that it is a good opportunity for us all together to grow and to see how God would speak to us in words that you probably very easily, unfortunately, can pass over as you're going through the Bible and think, what does the book of Habakkuk have to say to me today? It's a fun word to say. Habakkuk is a really interesting sounding name. So I hope you guys enjoy where we're going over the summer. Uh, but like I said, we have two weeks left in Luke and today is a real doozy uh, where we're going because this is probably the highlight of the entire Galilean ministry of Jesus and this is I think the spot where uh, Matthew and Luke position this uh, is really a climax point as we go forward into Jesus's move toward Jerusalem and so forth so uh, we are in Luke chapter 9 and we're going to be using Matthew chapter 16 which is the harmonic passage it's what Matthew also records from his perspective uh, as he was there for this very event and uh, the title of the message is an unexpected church growth strategy. And I will say that uh, as a pastor, you get all these different ideas that get tossed past you. What does it look like to grow a church? And uh, this morning, as we continue with the idea of unexpectedness throughout the Gospel of Luke, I want you to see there's a church growth strategy that Jesus talks about here that would be very unexpected to people who just decided how do you build an organization? How do you grow an organization? Jesus gives a way of doing it uh, that is very counterintuitive to us as human beings. So Luke chapter nine, verses 18 through 26. If you have a Bible, feel free to turn to that. Those online, you can look at a Bible uh, on your web browser on the internet. Uh, and the rest of you can stare up here at this lovely screen. So Luke chapter nine, verses 18 through 26 reads, now what happened that as he, talking about Jesus, was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And they asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say, Elijah. And others that one of the prophets of old has risen. And then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. And he strictly charged them. He commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So here's our big idea for the morning. Take a picture with your phone, write it down in your notebook, whatever you want to do. In light of the heavy cost of discipleship, and it is a heavy cost, and Jesus is plain teaching, and it is very plain about any genuine relationship with him, we see that the promise to build the church is dependent upon God and therefore in unshakable confidence. And I'll just kind of insert a little pastoral note here as you look at things like, especially over the past two years, the church attendance has been down 40 to 50% across the board uh, throughout the entire country. And you look at these things and, and especially from like a pastoral perspective, you look at it and you just think, man, what is going on? What is happening where people have just said, I don't see a need for the church and it's very easy, especially if you believe that the church's success and progress is built upon the ability of the church to bring people in the doors. It is very easy to look at it and say that the strategy for the church, we have to like reposition things and I, I saw actually just the other week uh, an interview with a couple of church leaders in the area who said like, yeah, we've seen attendance go through the roof online, online. And we, you know, people are watching our sermons, watching our services, and we just feel great about that. Uh, and I'll tell you, you know what? People might pivot into different methods of trying to get content to people, but that's not church growth. That's just not church growth. 
Church growth is a very different animal. Genuine church growth, what Jesus talks about here, and we don't need to pivot from anything because Jesus has been clear from day one what it looks like for the church to grow. And so even in the midst of a season where it seems like what is happening, it's like we're used to X number of people showing up at church on Sundays, and now it's like we're used to this down here. It's depressing for people. It's discouraging to think, wow, this just doesn't feel like it used to feel. And that might very well be the case, but Jesus is the same. Jesus does not change in the same same way that he has always built the church, the same way he's doing today. So I am hopeful that even as you sense discouragement and feel frustration over how the church seems to like just ebb and flow in certain ways, just understand that Jesus is Lord over it. He is ruling over it. He is doing exactly what he needs to do. And he makes a promise that it will ultimately succeed. And it's not dependent upon our ability to be charismatic, our ability to track people because we've got great programs or great light shows or any number of things like that. It's because he is building his church. It's supernatural. It's miraculous. And I hope that we walk out of here this morning with a sense of that confidence. So how that happen? Here we go, Luke 9, 18 through 20, and then we're going to hit to Matthew 16 after that. Now, it happened that as Jesus was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. So here's how Matthew, who was present for this, Matthew, the tax collector, who was converted under the ministry of Jesus, who came to him and spoke of mercy and of grace for him in his place of just bankruptcy and his sin could be found forgiven and renewed. Here's how Matthew, who's present for this event, records what happened, just this filling out of this event. Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, and I want to tell you right now before we go any further, Caesarea Philippi was an important place, and you see the first word in the name, the title of the place is Caesarea. Caesarea was established by somebody spout out. Who do you think? Caesar. Yes, exactly. It's not not too far of a stretch to to think that. So Caesar establishes this place. It's it's a very important kind of a of a city, and so it's it's what's happening here uh, throughout the Roman Empire is that people had to declare that Caesar is Lord. That's what they had to do if they were Roman citizens, and if they wanted to be in good standing with the Roman Empire, they would have to declare that Caesar is Lord. And then something happens here where Jesus positions the disciples in this place of Caesarean significance, and a confession is made that is very different than the confession of Caesar is Lord. Jesus is Lord, and this is what happens coming out of Peter's mouth. So Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And here's how this is fleshed out. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, Simon son of John, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And that's a really important thing to see at the end there that Matthew includes because he's giving Jesus' perspective on Peter's confession here. That what, what Peter in this place of Caesarean worship confesses is something that only God himself could bring into a human heart to rightly understand. So to this point, the first major confession of Christ, and that is what happens here, as both son of man and son of God was an opportunity for Jesus to state plainly this fact, if it's real, If that confession of Christ is real, it is a miracle. It's a miracle. So going back to this, um, when we think about the word miracle, usually the first thing that comes to mind for us is thinking about somebody who can't walk, being able to walk again, somebody who can't see, being able to see again. And so as, as the crowds are following Jesus around and he's doing certain things in their midst, people are expecting this and saying, the kingdom of God has certainly come because we see these things happening. And there is a point in that to be understood uh, as, as, a, as a sign that's been occurring. Jesus has been doing these things to point to the fact the kingdom of God has come, but there's a greater miracle that occurs that does not happen with everybody who's following Jesus. See, you had uh, things like the, the 10 lepers who are cleansed by Jesus. One of them comes back and gives thanks. So there are people who are experiencing and participating in these miracles of Jesus that he's, he's performing, these physical miracles. He's feeding thousands of people with just a little bit of food. 
These are the miracles people are used to seeing from Jesus, and yet behind the scenes here, Jesus is giving us a very clear sense of what the most significant miracle is that's occurring through his life. The most significant miracle that is occurring here through his life is not the fact that he's going around giving people sight or giving people legs to walk again. The most significant miracle that's happening here is that people like Peter are given to see him, Jesus, for who he actually is. I've said this to you guys before over the years, but I want you to be convinced of this, especially as you think about your own life and think, okay, what is God really doing in my life? What has God done in my life? If you have a genuine relationship with Jesus, if you see him for who he really is and you love that, that's a miracle. It is a miracle. And that's not just short selling something like saying, okay, well, we don't see these other miracles all over the place today, so what can we hang our hat on? Jesus himself says, this is a miracle if you understand me for who I am. It's because my father has revealed it to you. He's taken the blinders off, which you have on by nature, and he's given you sight, and that's a miraculous thing. Here's uh, how we see this also expressed in different passages. Matthew chapter 11 At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things. We talked a couple weeks ago about Jesus speaking in parables. That you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Again, there's that word, reveal, that God is revealing things to people. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So here, Peter had heard this teaching before you get to Matthew 16. Matthew 11 is before Matthew 16. You put the time together here. So Peter has heard this before and he's had kind of these hints about who Jesus is and this great confession is made in Matthew 16 and back of Peter's mind is like, I, I heard Jesus say something about this before. And so when Jesus says, blessed are you, it means happy are you. Happy are you, Simon, son of John, because guess what? The confession you just made is not due to anything that you deduced on your own, not anything due to you just concluded saying, yeah, I guess this makes sense because all kinds of people had seen Jesus. All people had seen Jesus' activity, what he had done, and yet Peter makes this confession that is unique. And Jesus says here, Matthew 11, the only people who know me for real are those that I choose to reveal myself to. If you're a Christian, that's true of you as well. If you're a Christian, that is true of you. Jesus has looked at you and said, you know what? I will reveal who I am to you. I will unblind you so you can see. That's a miracle. John chapter six. People who had been witnessing these things going on through Jesus' public ministry didn't like the things Jesus was saying, but they liked the things he was doing because they benefited from them. So here, verse 41, we find this. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They liked the bread that they were getting, getting, you know, this physical bread to fill their mouths and bellies with. But he made statements about being the bread that came down from heaven. So they're upset about this. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say I have come down from heaven? See, they don't get it. They don't understand. They don't understand the way that Peter came to understand. Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, and he has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. And so we get a, a fleshed out sense here of what it means when Jesus talks about believing on him. You get to John three sixteen. Whoever believes in him has eternal life, shall not perish. We hear this a lot. A lot of times we just equate belief with this sense of like a, a mental ascent that, okay, well, I guess I believe Jesus exists. And that's not the kind of belief Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about the kind of belief, this trust that is revealed to the human heart by Almighty God in this miraculous transaction where you are given eyes to see and a trust in Jesus that is unique and real. It's a gift. And Jesus says, no one comes to me unless the Father draws him. It doesn't mean people don't come to Jesus during his public ministry. It doesn't mean that people don't make professions of faith in Jesus today. It does mean nobody comes to him for real unless a supernatural act of God occurs in that person's heart. And as Peter makes this confession of Jesus as the son of man and as the son of God, 
Jesus celebrates this fact by saying, happy are you, Peter. Happy are you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses one through three. The Apostle Paul says this to the church at Corinth, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, does this mean that nobody can actually open their mouths and say that? No, that doesn't mean that. It does mean nobody can claim the Lordship of Jesus Christ as theirs personally unless the Holy Spirit does a supernatural work. I hope you are convinced as you see these words from Jesus' lips, you hear these words from the Apostle Paul as he's talking to a church that had gotten real keen and boasting in their own strength that your calling as a Christian, your confession of Jesus as son of man, as son of God, your confession of Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior and as your King is a supernaturally given, a supernaturally endowed work. There is not a single thing in you that ultimately concluded this. You weren't smart enough. You weren't good enough. You weren't attractive enough. You weren't anything enough. It was God in his sheer and sovereign grace that said, I'm, I'm gonna open your eyes. And just as he went to Lazarus' tomb and said, Lazarus, get out of the grave. He did that with you. He says as much to Peter. And this matters because, so is this just a matter of theology? Okay, because at this point, a lot of people think this is just, okay, great hypothetical stuff and you can talk about this all day. Does it really make any difference? Does it make any other difference than just I understand this to be what the Bible says? Now I move on with my life. Why does this matter? Well, here's what Jesus goes on to say and this is why it matters. Luke 9, 21 through 26, he strictly charged and commanded them. This might sound really strange to you, especially if Jesus is trying to build an organization up. He strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So here's why it matters. To see Jesus for who he is and to hear his call for what it is flies directly in the face of everything our fallen selves want in a God or in a life favored by a God. It's the greatest miracle on earth today. So what I am saying with this and just kind of the short statement it matters that Jesus is the one who opens your eyes because what Jesus demands from you and his very character and nature and identity flies in the face of everything that you naturally want to believe about God. For thousands of years, humanity has concocted different ways to relate to spiritual things. We have concocted all kinds of different ways to feel like we're connecting with the divine. We have concocted all kinds of ways to feel like, yeah, you know, I feel close to God. These different practices that people uh, employ, these different ideas of, of a deity, of spirituality that people get in their heads, everything from just kind of absorbing into nirvana to people coming up with thousands of gods who are fighting each other and doing some really bizarre things behind the scenes. All kinds of different ideas have been put out there by people. And the reason this is the case is because by nature we are spiritual people and we want to connect with spiritual things. The problem is we don't want to connect with the God who is because of who he is. If you can concoct a God who is unholy, you in your unholiness will feel at home with him or her. But if you as you are, I as I am, are born fallen and born in love with ourselves and love with our sin, there's no reason for us to look at a God who is holy and who says, I will not give my glory to another and to say, I think I like that God. I think I like that God. Furthermore, not only is the idea that the nature and character of God offensive to us, but what Jesus demands from his disciples is completely offensive. Jesus says to us, if you don't deny yourself, you can't be my disciple. And you need to let that sink in. Jesus makes a whole life claim on you. There is nothing that, that you can say, okay, I'm just gonna put this over here, Jesus, and you can't touch this. 
Jesus says, all of you is mine or none of you is mine. You can't split anything here. There are no percentages as a disciple of Jesus. That doesn't mean that you don't deal with your sin and struggle with your sin. It doesn't mean that you have a hard time and frustrations with yourself. It doesn't mean that, but what it does mean is this. At the end of the day, you're gonna either bow your knee to Jesus or you're gonna bow your knee to somebody else. And his claim on your life is what you're gonna say, I will submit to you, Lord Jesus, as much as it flies in the face of everything I naturally want, or I'm just gonna walk away. And sadly, most people walk away, which is why it matters that God is the one who gives you life, because if he doesn't, we're all toast. Luke 9, 21 through 22, again, he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. This sure seemed like a strange identity for the coming king. Matthew 21, 8 through 11, Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday, a date that we remember, celebrate when Jesus comes into Jerusalem in order to be crucified, everybody thinks something different upon Jesus' arrival. Again, think expectations of Jesus versus who he really is. Why does it matter that God is the one that gives you eyes to see him for real? Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road and the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. They're excited. Their hopes are up. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now again, think like Peter is asked the question, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? The response of Peter there is supernaturally given. The response of this crowd, not so much. They have expectations of who Jesus should be. Those expectations don't get met within a few short days, and then this is what happens. Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? This is in Jerusalem. We're in this place. All these things are happening. Excitement, 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 and he's arrested. He's asked you the king of the Jews. Jesus said, you have said so. When he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Now, if you're not aware who Barabbas was, Barabbas was an insurrectionist. Barabbas was a zealot. Barabbas was one who championed the idea that the people of Israel could be freed from Roman bondage by force. So he had been held captive by the Romans. Obviously, this is an individual that you don't want roaming your streets, doing whatever he feels like. And so Barabbas is the one that's been kept. And Barabbas is not only a real person here, but he's representative of what the human heart chooses all the time. Jesus, the son of God and son of man, comes into the city of Jerusalem. Everybody thinks, okay, guess what? Insurrection, real insurrection against the Romans. Jesus is gonna help us with this. He's gonna do this for us. We see Barabbas, and Barabbas wasn't performing miracles. He's in prison right now, but we know that when Jesus comes, he's gonna free Barabbas, and everybody around here is just gonna tell the Romans to go and pound sand and free the land up, and this is where it's gonna be. They didn't get that from Jesus. Their identity in their heads of who Jesus was was skewed because of sin. They hadn't had their eyes open to see him as Peter had seen him. So here's what happens. Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ, Messiah, the one who is to come? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. This is, this is the end result, folks. This is the end result of the human heart's relationship to Jesus for who he actually is and what he demands. Crucify him. Get rid of him. Get rid of him. 
This is always the case, but I think more and more and more, you see this reflected in the culture around us who just says, get Jesus out of here. We want nothing to do with him. Get him out. And if they could crucify him over again, they would. And you're not in that crowd, if you're not in that crowd, only because God has revealed from heaven that Jesus is worthy of worship and adoration and trust and honor and submission. That's the only reason. This is why it matters. Is because when you see people around you who are saying, you know what, who cares about Jesus? Who cares about the one that you go to worship? Who cares about your Sundays? Why would you waste your Sundays? You could be resting. You could be at home, go on vacation, any number of other things. Why do you waste your time with this invisible sky fairy? You know it's not a waste because God has given you eyes to see. That's why it matters. So regarding Jesus' identity, it's important you see him for who he is, but here's another thing uh, that I want you to see, and this is as Jesus speaks and he, he tells us what it is to be his disciple. He says, you can't be my disciple if you don't lay down your own life because it's not gonna profit you a single thing if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul. I'm gonna read for you a quote here from America's most popular pastor, most popular pastor in the country, biggest church in the entire country, Mr. Joel Osteen. And his name is somewhat of a pejorative in itself around here, and it should be because he is a false teacher. I have no problem saying that. He is a false teacher, and here is one of the things, he wrote a book, he's written several books, unfortunately, but one of the books he wrote is called Every Day of Friday. It sounds like a fun thing, right? I mean, like Fridays, want to have weekends forever. Uh, if heaven's just an eternal Friday, what a great thing that is. And, and Joel's idea is that you can experience every single day as a Friday on this fallen world. Here's a quote from Joel's book, Every Day of Friday, which you can surely find at a goodwill near you. He says, I say this respectfully, but we have to fight the religious spirit that says we're supposed to be poor, broke, and defeated to prove to everyone that we're really humble. When we're poor, broke, and defeated, all that proves is that we're poor, broke, and defeated. Nobody will want what we have. I can be poor, broke, and defeated without serving God. We're supposed to be examples of what it means to live for the most high God. We should be so blessed, so prosperous, so kind, so generous, so happy, and so peaceful that people will want what we have. What do you have, Joel? If you think you're showing God how holy you are and how humble you are by not wearing your blessings and not taking that promotion, your own thinking is what is keeping God from doing something new in your life. Those are absolutely hideous, disgusting, despicable words. And if they don't make your skin crawl, please ask the Lord what's wrong with your heart. See, what Joel is saying here is that once you gain the whole world, people will want what you have. And what you have is the world. And Jesus himself said, what will it profit you if gain all of that and lose your own soul? It's a very backwards way of doing things. And if Jesus is trying to build an organization based on what you naturally want, what you naturally want, what I naturally want is this. We want everything. We want everything. Nobody starts out life saying, hey, I'd like to live a mediocre life somewhere and uh, just making enough to make ends meet. And nobody says that. They all say, I want to be president. I want to be a celebrity. I want to be an entertainer. I want all these different things. I want money, 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 cars, women, whatever. And Jesus says, it's not going to profit you a single thing if you gain all of that and you lose your soul. What Joel is advocating here and what's natural to the human heart is gain the whole world. Gain the whole world. And Jesus says, you can't do that. You can't do it. Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. In Luke 14, we'll come to this in a handful of months in the fall when we get back to Luke. If anyone comes to me, Jesus says, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple 
Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus' church growth strategy is as he's introducing himself to people, he's saying, guess what? You want me? You're gonna get me. And who cares about anything else? If I'm not your treasure, then I'm not anything to you. This is a very bizarre way to grow a church if you're just trying to appeal to people on the basis of what they naturally want. It has to be a supernatural thing that God does. If he doesn't do it, Jesus makes sense to this many people. Zero. So a church built on real miracles. Matthew 16, 16 through 18. Again, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Really blessed. Not the Joel Osteen blessed. Really blessed are you, Simon, son of John. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So knowing the church is built by God himself frees us from depending on personal charisma, impressiveness, and new strategies and leads us to a challenging but rewarding dependence upon God himself. I will tell you, I will be the first to tell you that it is very frustrating to see that churches often get built because of these things. I get envious of it. It's frustrating. When people will build churches that proclaim the name of Jesus and and they aren't out there necessarily teaching Joel Osteen level type stuff, but they'll build churches based on personal charisma and strategies for how can we do this and really get people in the doors this way and that way, not depending upon the gospel or upon changed lives or community filled with love for one another. Instead saying, you know what, we're just going to build the biggest building possible. We're going to have the biggest events possible. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to just tease people as much as we can to get them in the doors. Then we'll give them Jesus. They'll want Jesus at that point. And what I tell you is that in doing so, God may work in spite of the fact that that's done, but he's not gonna work because of that because what happens is just as many people welcome Jesus in at Palm Sunday saying, yeah, Jesus, 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 they turn around just as quickly and say crucify him because they don't get what they really want from Jesus, which is stuff. So when you come to terms with this and you embrace the fact that, you know what? Jesus promised to build his church. He says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That the very place where all these decisions, deliberations, schemes, and strategies of the devil himself are formed, Jesus says that that very place is not gonna be able to stand against my progress. Now, clearly this doesn't mean that nothing bad ever happens in the church. But what it does mean is that Jesus' purposes for the church will succeed. They will succeed. He doesn't fail. He doesn't fail. And when we realize that and when we come to terms with it, it frees us up from thinking we have to be like the world to attract the world. That's not the case. The Apostle Paul says this to the church at Corinth who among any other church was, was definitely adopting this way of doing things. They were probably the first, uh, first church that developed mega church strategies for church growth. And Paul corrects them as he writes this letter. He says, I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided, and this was Paul's resolve, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. Nothing impressive, nothing personally charismatic here. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom. I mean, he wasn't trying to impress them with the same philosophies that they had loved, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So this demonstration of the spirit and of power, it's these are the miracles that God is performing where people's lives and hearts are being changed, where things that seem foolish and stupid to them before in the gospel start making sense. If you're a Christian, that's happened to you. Whether in a subtle way, whether in a really pronounced way, but whatever the case might be, 
it's happened to you. And so the real, the, the real power at work through the Holy Spirit is to say you're gonna be brought to life. You're not gonna get your best life now. You're not gonna get all this kind of stuff that you just want by nature. I'm gonna change your nature. I'm gonna give you eyes to see. I'm gonna give you ears to hear. And you're gonna want me, Jesus, does that through the preaching of the gospel. We're gonna finish up on this, John chapter six, verses 35 through 40. Jesus said to them, these are the people who are grumbling, arguing with him. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. There's this conflict occurring. Why is this happening? Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him, really, truly believes in him, should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. This is the confidence, just as we hear the words from Jesus' mouth to Peter, saying that the church will not fail. Jesus is saying, not a single one whom the Father has given me from all of eternity is going to perish. I will keep you. That's not because you come up with clever strategies. It's because Jesus said, you're mine. And the church is Jesus' church. That's why it succeeds. Local churches struggle and suffer. Local churches open and close. Local expressions of the body of Christ seem to have high seasons and low seasons, but when it's all said and done, the church of Jesus Christ, the whole entity, the whole body throughout all of history, Jesus says, it's not gonna be stopped because it's mine. It's gonna be built because it's mine. It's not dependent on you to do it because you can't do it. You won't wanna do it. You're gonna wanna come to Jesus for bread instead of seeing Jesus as bread. It takes a miracle for that to change in the human heart. And so what we celebrate when we come together on Sundays, we celebrate the fact that Jesus has done this miraculous thing. When you look around, the whole point, purpose to look around and say, Jesus has done this miraculous thing in this person's life, this person's life, and this person's life. And why would you not want more of that when you think about people around you that don't yet know Jesus? Jesus said, you come to me, I'm not gonna cast you out. And if you really come to me, the only reason why is because the Father has brought you to me. This is the confidence that we have when we look at the purpose of Jesus through the church. And when Peter makes this first confession of Christ, it's the moment where Jesus can be really, really clear with us saying, guess what, Peter, you're gonna be the leader of the early church. And everybody who's gonna come after you, I'm gonna build my church on this confession that you're making right now. And the only way any single one of them is ever gonna come to that same conclusion is because the same thing that happened in your heart will happen in theirs. And that frees you up and it gives you confidence, at least it should. And as we go into the summertime, when church attendance tends to dip, and as we look at ways to engage people the gospel, don't ever and don't let me ever get into a place where we think that somehow just being strategic is gonna help. Seeking the Lord and doing what he's called you to do, that's what's gonna do it. That's the confidence we have when we see Peter's life in your life. Worship team, please come up. Uh, we're gonna pray together. I'm gonna finish with two songs. And we can go out and eat some cake and love each other. <sighs> Father, we bless you and we give you thanks that you have given us eyes to see and you've given us ears to hear. We don't deserve that for a second. We don't, we, we didn't make ourselves smart enough to conclude that you are who you are, Jesus. It's a miracle and we thank you for doing a miracle in our lives and we ask you jealously, Lord, we ask you to work that miracle in the lives of other people. That you would not only build your church as a whole, which will certainly happen, but we ask you just specifically to, to build the life of this church. You would give us the privilege of seeing and celebrating work happening in the lives of people who don't yet know you, and yet the lights come on because you turn them on. As we finish here in song, Lord, please encourage and nourish our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.